Are you tired of advertisements? You can listen to this episode and more ad-free for only $1 a month by supporting the show on Patreon. Visit MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com and hit the Patreon tab for more details. Georgia area and across country. It follows me wherever I go. Basically, ever since I was a little kid, like I said, this is my craziest. Ever since I was a little kid, I always felt like I was being watched, recorded, studied, what have you. You Call it paranoia, call it anxiety, call it a one child out of six siblings wanting to feel important, whatever, what have you. This thing, this entity, forgive me, but I was in love with the Goblin King from the Labyrinth, so I called it the Goblin King. I would always feel it watching me, but that plays a part of this story later on. Anyways, my older brother, he once did a high school project on the helpfulness of sleep deprivation to ESP. He stayed up for two weeks. And he did all kinds of experiments on us younger siblings. You know, what are younger siblings for? My favorite game that he started us playing was, we were in Perry, Georgia at the time. My favorite game was, guess what color car was going to come down the road in front of our house? And I became quite good at this game. Whether sheer dumb luck or his research was actually doing something for a middle school project or a high school project, whatever. Ever since then, I think I was about 11, this phenomena has happened every year. Stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve, no matter where I'm at. It started that year. It was our first year that our parents were allowing us to stay up past midnight to celebrate the new year. I was happening to look outside and I saw a red convertible Mustang. Beautiful car. I've always loved that car. But then the next year, it happened again and I was just like huh what a a coincidence it's become a New Year's Eve tradition for me I am an over the road truck driver per my other stories I've even seen it going down the grapevine in California 16 years 17 years ago out of nowhere this red convertible Mustang comes just flying past the truck on a dark mountain road anyways Nobody ever believes me when I tell them, look, look, there it is, there it is, stroke of midnight, there's my red freaking car. 
nobody ever believes me because no one's ever paying attention. It's a silly thing. Back to middle Georgia. I was in Macon, Georgia at this time, about 26, 27 years old. And I was trying to show a family friend my tradition. It was a crazy year. It was 73 degrees out at midnight and the fog was so thick you couldn't see anything past 10 feet from your face. So how in the world was I going to see my little red convertible? Well, I told him, I said, come on, come on, I got to show you this quick, quick before the clock strikes midnight. So he walked while I ran down my parents' driveway. It was like 30 yards. It was a long driveway concealed by woods. I look at my clock and I'm peering down towards the roadway, which is about 100 feet from the cul-de-sac. And the street light illuminates a red car. I'm not going to admit if it was the red convertible. It was just a red car. So I thought, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm going to call it that it's the, my red convertible. So I turn around to see if the friend of the family had seen it or not. And when I turn around, I'm all alone in a foggy cul-de-sac in the middle of the woods. And this hulking black thing, to which I honestly thought was the neighbor's mailbox, starts just like getting darker, so dark enough that you can see it through that thick fog. And it starts coming towards me. All logic runs from my head and I literally run back down the driveway and run into the family friend halfway down the driveway. I never left the house after dark after that night again because the feeling when I left that house was that that thing that had been watching me my whole entire life wasn't good anymore. Basically, it was a, oh, you're grown now. Now you can defend yourself, to which I can't. I really can't. And this thing, I don't know what it was. I, it was hairy. It was black. And uh, about when it was hulking towards me out of the edge of the cul-de-sac, it was about my height, about five foot five, five foot seven, but I didn't stick around to ask it questions. Thank you for letting me share. It is my craziest story. I'll let you know it's June 1st now of 2023. I'll call in after New Year's Eve and let you know if I've seen my little red convertible. <laughs> Thank you so much again for letting anybody share their story your podcast is great I'll later you know the weird thing here is that we opened last year's best of special with a call from a cat in California opening with another tonight is pure happenstance and I can't say for sure if both cats are the same person or not but I have my suspicions that they are Either way, thank you, Cat, for the entry. And you know, I'm curious as well. Maybe you should have a camera ready this time. Let's see if there really is something special about this red convertible. Or maybe this is all just one big coincidence. Either way, be sure to let us know. Because we'll be waiting here with bated breath. Now, like I'd mentioned in the opener, this is the best of 2023 special. The top dozen or so calls based on a number of different variables. We got input from our social media pages. I discussed with a few of the folks that work on the show. And of course, most of them are just favorites of mine from this past season. In no particular order. 
but I will kick us off with one of my favorites from this past season. An eerie entry about a potential murder and cover-up that was so unusual, it almost had to be paranormal. So from season 15, episode 3, please welcome this anonymous caller out of Texas back to the program. Hi, Derek. I'd like to remain anonymous. This didn't happen to me. This happened to my friend. And this was in high school. So it would have been summer of 07. It was just a normal day. It was a sunny day. Um, my dad was pretty cool with kids coming over, so I kind of had the safe house where we'd all come over and just hang out. And so it wasn't really irregular for people to show up just out of the blue. So that day we were just hanging out at my house. And one of our buddies showed up just tell us he had something on his mind and it didn't take long for him to get into it but uh that's where he revealed this story to us that had happened that day that morning i'll call him ronnie that's not his real name but i'll call him that we lived in flower mound texas his summer job this guy he was a linebacker for our football team he's a big stocky italian kid so his job in the summertime he was a mover and they were doing a job in a town called tyler texas which is kind of a small town and actually the move was taking place outside of that town on some dirt roads uh, i don't exactly know where but it was in the middle of nowhere from what he told us anyways they're moving the sky out there to a trailer trailer house in the middle of nowhere outside of tyler texas and uh, when they got there you know sort of just a normal day normal move they start getting into it my friend, at some point, he's taking something around the back side of the trailer, and the grass is kind of tall, kind of unkept. And he glances over and notices a hand sticking up out of the grass, a human hand, and double takes it and walks right over to it, and sure enough, it's a dead guy. So immediately, he knows he has to get out of there. There's something not right about this. So he goes, and it's just him and his boss on that move. He goes and he tells his boss what he just found. And his boss uh, comes up with a short plan. He says, all right, go wait in the truck and I'm gonna tell this guy that, you know, we're gonna go on lunch and we're, we're gonna leave, we're, we're getting out of here. So Ronnie goes and waits in the truck and his boss is just supposed to go in and tell the guy that, He'll be right back out. Well, a few minutes pass. Ronnie said he's starting to smoke a cigarette. He said he starting to get worried because it's taking a long time. He said he finishes that cigarette, still not out. He says he gets out of the truck and starts kind of pacing back and forth because he's starting to get worried like something happened and he doesn't know what to do. He's freaking out. Miraculously, he's looking around and he finds a baseball bat on the side of that trailer and grabs it. His only option in his mind at that time is to march through the front door and uh, see what's going on. And so he does just that. He opens the front door as hard as he can and the first thing he sees, I guess, how the trailer's set up is it's in the kitchen area. And his boss is tied up to a chair, bleeding from the head, and there's a broken lamp. So he goes towards him, and I guess there's a corner of the wall right before you get to him. And right before he gets his boss, the guy at the house that they're moving jumps out, and he has a gun. Well, my friend has that bat and just swings it and knocks him out knocks into the ground knocks i mean just it, it's like something out of a movie hits the guy hits him in the eye he says he's beating this guy in the ribs with a bat and he says he just beats the living hell out and i'll explain the guy who who they're moving who had the gun so he was a middle-aged um, to older caucasian man and he was skinny he wore really thick glasses he wore shorts up to his belly button just looks almost just really kind of nerdy, like creepily kind of nerdy. So my friend being a linebacker, it, it wasn't hard for him to overtake this man, even with a gun. He, and, you know, he definitely had to get lucky not to get shot, but he beat this guy down, untied his boss. They got out of there. They sped down these dirt roads to Tyler, to Tyler, Texas, and went right to the police station and told the cops. The cops kept him in the police station and went out to this guy's trailer out there and um, came back and... I asked my buddy, I was like, so what, what did we know what happened? What'd they find? What'd they find out there? And my buddy, he said, when they went out there, they didn't find any evidence of a body in the backyard. This is what the cops were telling. 
There was no evidence in the kitchen of that trailer that any struggle had happened. And I asked my friend, you know, I was like, you, you really beat that guy with that bat? He said, yeah, I, I hit him in the ribs. It's, I mean, as hard as I can, but I mean, he was not getting up, you know? I mean, what would you do in a life and death situation? And so the guy wasn't there. The guy that my friend had beaten with the bat wasn't there. Nothing was there. The cops said no evidence was found. And so that was so weird. A week later, I would ask my friend, did the, did the cops ever get back to you? Did they ever find anything? My friend was like, no, they never got back to us. And I would just periodically ask my friend, what, what, what happened with all this? You know, this is a serious deal and um, nothing ever came of it. It seems like something like that would be pretty serious. But in my mind, either the cops were in on it or there was someone else out there that was able to clean everything up before the cops got there or there was something paranormal going on. I don't know how else to chalk it up. But uh, th this really happened. Ronnie was not a guy to make stories up like this at all. Pretty serious guy, a tough guy. And um, it freaked him out. And I, in my mind, one of the weirdest parts was that no evidence was found or seemingly. I'll always keep this with me because it sounds like something that out of a movie. Anyways, thanks for your time. Love your show, Derek. I listen every day. Bye. Thanks, caller. Now, this story is one of the weirder ones we've ever featured. And I still agree. It's very odd that nothing ever came of the report. But I guess that's one of the many aspects that make this one one of my favorites this year. Now, folks, this next entry was first aired back on Season 15, Episode 17, and comes to us from Mickey out of Oklahoma. Hello, Derek and Monsters Among Us podcast listeners. This is Mickey T in OKC calling in with another submission. Got to thinking about all the different things that have happened in my life, and I thought I'd give you guys a story that took place when I was an infant. And this was back in 1979. So, of course, I don't remember it, but my family does. I was in a car with my mother and father, and so both of them were the ones who told me the story. But anyways, it takes place in California in the mountains. We were on our way home, headed back to Glendora, Pasadena. At the time, it was night. My mother was driving. I was in the back seat asleep. We didn't have car seats back then. So I was just bundled up in a blanket, laying in the back seat. And my dad was in the passenger seat asleep. He had been driving all day and, well, you know how it goes, you switch off. So anyways, but back in the 70s, to those of us who were around back then, remember that there was CBs in most vehicles, cars, trucks, semis, even today. But back then, everyone communicated on the road as they were driving, you know, whether the weather was bad or things were ahead. So, or you just had conversations with people you didn't know. And at the time, we were driving a Volvo station wagon and our uh, handle was Snowball. And my dad had been talking to a semi who was in front of us and there was a car behind us with four college kids well the semi driver was a single you know big rig driver so he was alone and then the four college students that were behind us were in their own vehicle so all three of us were going through this pass in the mountains at the same period the cb had gone quiet because it was late and my dad had gone to take a nap in the passenger seat at a certain point in the road what my mom says she saw was two people standing on this hairpin curve. And at first, as she started to come upon them, she thought they were just two people in need. And they were dressed oddly, though. At first, it just looked like regular people. So she thought they were needing help. They were waving their arms, come here. And it was a male and a female. The male was dressed in 50s, 60s outfit, 
you know, kind of the greaser type with blue jeans and the cuffs were rolled, white t-shirt and the cuffs on the sleeves were rolled on his shirt and his hair was slicked back and the girl was wearing what looked like a poodle skirt and, you know, a dress of that kind from that period of the 50s and 60s. But what really freaked her out was when she got closer, she realized they had no feet and she could see through their eyes, uh, see the sky, the stars and moon behind them. And then she realized they were hovering out over the edge. They weren't actually on the shoulder, they were out over the cliff. So when she got closer and noticed that, she had slowed down because she was thinking that they were a couple legitimately needing help. But then when she saw all that detail, she sped up and screaming and beating on my father, you know, to wake up that she just saw something horrifying. And then, of course, my dad wakes up wanting to know what's wrong. And he says, turn around, let's go back. I want to see. And she goes, hell no, I'm not going back. Well, he remembered that he had been talking to the, you know, trucker and those kids earlier and was curious if they had seen it. So he got on the CB and called ahead to the truck driver to find out if he had seen anything. And he said, hell yeah, I saw something. And he said, well, where are you? He says, I'm already off the mountain. I'm pushing 120. He says, I am not going back that direction again. Well, my dad got a chuckle out of that and contacted the four college students and they too had seen the same thing the two individuals floating off the side of the mountain shoulder there anyway my mother and father and i pull into this all-night truck stop and met up with the truck driver and the four college students and my parents got me out and we all went into the uh, truck stop and my parents had coffee with the uh, five individuals and spoke about what they all saw and everyone confirmed that they saw the same thing two individuals no eyes no feet hovering off the shoulder cliff on a hairpin turn in the mountains anyways pretty interesting story i wish i could have seen it for myself but I tend to believe both my mom and dad when they told me the story and saying that they had had others that saw it at the same time to confirm it. Anyways, good luck, enjoy the podcast, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Take care. Now being a California mountain resident myself, I really enjoyed this one. Greaser ghosts. Man, I wish they had dash cams back then. I would have loved to lay eyes on these enigmatic entities. And you know, coincidentally, earlier this calendar year, something almost exactly like this did occur in the state of Arizona. And here is a clip courtesy of WOFL, Fox 35, out of Orlando. Our first look at the biggest paranormal news stories of 2023. All right, take a look at this one. A truck driver in Arizona says that there were no cars in sight when his dashboard camera captured this. Okay, he thinks it's a transparent figure on State Route 87 in Maricopa County. Okay, it's a little creepy. Mm -hmm. Happened around 2.30 a.m. Saturday morning. The driver says the figure was standing in the road. Thus far, they've had this analyzed. No one has been able to explain exactly what it is at this point. Now, if you haven't seen the actual video, I highly recommend it. You can find links to everything featured tonight in the show notes at monstersamonguspodcast.com. See, this is why I keep saying to get a dash camera. I don't know what those truckers caught on camera that evening, but it sure looks like a ghost to me. And I sure am happy that they had a camera rolling when it all went down. Now this next entry was suggested by a good number of you as one of the greatest of the year. From the Mirrored Men Special, Season 15, Episode 7, please welcome Rob from Louisiana. Hey Derek, Rob here. So I'm calling from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm calling right now, I'm at the 
property where all this happened. It's kind of an odd location. And so let me just start by, I guess, describing it to you. So I just came outside, and my my partner, Elise, and I, we bought a couple of vacant lots in this industrial part of town. I don't know if you can hear it. There's like a train going by right now. It's about 50 yards from the house. There's some different, you know, industrial companies. There's like a dumpster company that's about 100 yards away. There's a furniture repair place. There's a meat pie factory. Uh, And then there's also just some houses and some neighbors. But for the most part, it's just, you know, industrial stuff, vacant lots. But it's right in the middle of the city. So it's in this nexus between a couple of different highways, a couple of different train tracks, and also this kind of drainage canal that kind of cuts the neighborhood into a triangle. And all this is to say that it's really noisy here. And so I'm a teacher, I'm a GED teacher at the community college. I teach night classes, but then when I come home at night, I also write songs, I write stories and things like that. And I usually do it in the bathroom, which I know is kind of a weird place to do that. But, you know, like I said, we we don't have a ton of space because we're just building it little piece by piece. And so we kind of basically have an outhouse that's connected to the house we live in by a porch and so I go into the outhouse bathroom slash recording studio kind of place to make songs or whatever so a few nights ago I get home from work and I go into the bathroom to just try to play some music and I sat down and I have this old broken guitar and it's not super in tune or anything but it was late at night when I started this maybe like 10 p.m. or so but It's usually pretty loud at night, loud during the day. You know, like I say, middle of the city. I'm in there and I just start kind of playing this riff. This is the part, it's it's not terribly out of the ordinary, uh, this part, but it's, again, it's worth mentioning that like, sometimes I'll be in the bathroom and I'll just play for a while and I can hear all the things going on outside. There's rats skittering by underneath the outhouse. There's possums up in the tree. There's, you know, birds. We have two cats. You know, there's just, you know, ambulances going by. There's gunshots off in the distance. It's just, you know, it's a city. And a city in America, at least. So I'm playing this song, and I kind of get into this repetitive, almost hypnotic state with it. And I start just kind of singing, you know, whatever comes to my mind. And the thing that comes to my mind is this one by one, two by two, three by three. And I just start kind of saying it over and over and over again. I'm not really thinking about it. I'm just playing music, just kind of babbling to myself, which probably sounds weird, but you know, I don't know, that's how I write. And then I'm doing this for a while. I'm not quite sure how long I'm doing this for, but I think it's maybe because I've been listening to your podcast a lot, which I love. And I get the mirrored men stuck in my head which scare the crap out of me, (laughs) like a lot of your listeners. I I don't know what it is. It's just, I don't get freaked out very often by by spooky stuff, but there's something about the mirrored men and uh, I, 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 I can't even, I can't explain it. So I think it's the number three, the three by three that makes me start thinking about these mirrored men. And when I started thinking about it, I'm still playing the song. I'm still kind of doing this, almost this chant. And I'm aware, this sounds weird, but I don't know how long this is going on for, but eventually I'm like, you know what, I'm going to write a Mirrored Men song because it's October, it's spooky time, and, you know, I do this thing where I try to write a song every week and then I share it, and in October I try to write, you know, spooky songs. And so I'm like, oh, that's this is perfect, I'll do a Mirrored Men kind of song. So I listened to a couple of the clips. I'm, I'm kind of searching around in your podcast and I'm listening to the different ones. And, I, you know, I start getting myself all worked up and freaked out a little bit. You know, I, maybe I record a little bit and I'm just kind of pr- playing that riff over and over and over again, this kind of hypnotic thing. And all of a sudden, I I just, I kind of stop for a second. I don't know why I stop, but I, you know, I stop. And everything is silent. Everything outside, at least, is silent, which never happens here. It's the middle of the city. There's just stuff going on always. So you could always just hear this white noise, and it's just completely silent, which I've never heard before. I put the guitar down for a second, and I was just listening. It's not that the 
creatures and the insects and everything are quiet like it would be in the woods if you started walking through the woods it's just silent like there's no there's no cars there's no white noise there's no train sounds there's no gunshots in the distance there's no nothing and it sets off this really freaky feeling in me like it's it just it sounds unnaturally quiet so i have my grandfather's hunting knife he made it in the 40s he was in world war ii he liked to make stuff he made this hunting knife it's kind of like a family heirloom and i keep it in the bathroom there because i use it for all kinds of different things but in that moment i put the guitar down i get the hunting knife for some reason i don't know what i'm gonna do stab the silence but i it just like it, it i i I had this kind of fight or flight fear take over me, so I get the hunting knife. I'm there in my underwear because I'm at my house just holding this knife and listening to the silence. And I listen, and it's just, it's just, it's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. And I want to kind of go outside, but I have this, just this primal fear take over me that's almost like there's this thing in my head that says, like, don't go outside. There's something weird going on outside right now. And so I've got my ear to the door. I'm holding this old knife, standing there in my underwear, and I'm, like, getting up the courage to go outside, stone cold sober. And the thing that breaks the silence is it's my cat. Gator, I hear the cat flap, the, the cat door, and I hear him come out and he goes, ow, which he kind of has this like, he sounds like he, he's asking a question. And immediately the moment he does that, all the sounds come back. All the white noise, all the trains, all of the ambulance in the distance, the rustling wind. I couldn't even hear wind in that moment. Everything kind of comes back. It was almost like he had broke the silence. but. What it sounded like to me, it was as though everything, the trees, the houses, the highway, just everything's just holding its breath for a moment or had been paused for a moment. And then it got broken by my loud cat, uh, which is kind of funny, but it, it also kind of broke the, the fear in me hearing him. So I go outside, I pet him, I look around, everything looks normal. But I go back inside and I go back into the bathroom, I pick up the guitar and I'm like, I'm gonna, I gotta get this song done so I can get some sleep. And I look at the clock and it is 5 a.m. <laughs> and, uh, which is crazy, you know, I, I, I go back outside, I look around and yeah, the, the light's starting to change, like the sun is coming up. And so I think I mentioned at the beginning, I started this at like 10 p.m. I couldn't have played music for more than, you know, two hours tops. I don't even think that long. And I listened to the silence for like, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes maybe, just standing there with, with the knife in my underwear, just freaking myself out. And it's now somehow it's 5 a.m., which is bizarre because I'm thinking about the mirrored men, which are related to lost time. And I get into this zone about it. I'm playing this song about it. And then I lose like what, five hours of time all of a sudden. And yeah, it, it freaked me out. So I was just like, I'm, I'm done for the night. I'll get back to the song later. I finished it the next day, but I'm a bit I, somewhat of a skeptic, you know, like I, I get a kick out of this kind of stuff. I like your podcast. That's the first time that I've noticed uh, a time slip or anything or a lost time. And I don't really know what it means. I know that just from listening to your podcast and other ones, some people have suggested that all the paranormal weird stuff is all kind of intertwined and that the reason that it sets off this kind of spooky fear in us is because the whatever the fear part of your brain or the adrenaline that gets released it somehow taps into this stuff I don't know I probably just freaked myself out because it was late at night and I was thinking about the mirrored men but I thought it was worth sharing because it was kind of interesting I've never heard that kind of silence before um, and I'm really grateful for Gator for coming out and breaking it with his meow I appreciate you talk to you later thanks Dave.
suggest you go check out that Beard Men special. Again, that's season 15, episode 7. And that's actually Rob the Taxman himself with The Meared Men, the actual song written in his story. And I gotta say, it's not bad at all, Rob. In fact, it's almost enchanting. Now, folks, I'll play the full song at the end of the broadcast for anyone that would like to hear it in its entirety. The old Meared Men have been awfully quiet lately. I think I need to dig through the library and see if we've had any encounters reported lately. And you know, I saw a comment online somewhere recently where someone was asking if all the Meard Men witnesses are still alive and not met strange or unusual ends. Well, I can't say for certain that they all are, but I can say with the utmost confidence that the original Meard Men witness is still going strong. Hello, man. But how about the rest of you? If you died as a result of these nefarious figures, do me a favor and reach out and let me know. And speaking of my old friend, Matt, the Meard Men witness, we had a couple of guests join us this year, and Matt was one of them, where he discussed his encounter with us in more detail. And we were also joined by Allie from Let's Get Haunted for a special between-season episode. And I was also joined a few times by my wife, Sarah, over on the Beyond. I'd like to have more guests on the program, so I'll see what I can do about that in this upcoming year. Not only is it fun to get other perspectives, but it also helps the show immensely in its growth and outreach. Now, folks, if you have a call you would like to have shared on the show, perhaps a mirrored men call, just ring us up on our hotline at 888-608-NIGHT. That's 888-608-NIGHT. Now then, this next entry seemed like something out of a movie. It was hotly debated when it first premiered on Season 15, Episode 12. Devin from Washington State. Welcome to the program. Hello, this is Devin calling from Washington, Wenatchee. The encounter that I want to tell you happened in Missouri. It was Martin City. So I was probably about 14, maybe 15 when it had happened. And... I was in a group home type facility and I had, uh, I had run away and I was on the run and I was in the woods when this had taken place. I was walking through the woods and I had come across a soybean field and it was in the middle of the night. I would guess probably between 11 and midnight, somewhere in there. I was walking through the soybean field and I was, well, I was getting ready to walk into the soybean field. I just exited the woods and had entered into the soybean field and I was watching a herd of deer that were eating the soybeans. They hadn't noticed me yet and all of a sudden they lifted their head and they looked over to the wood line across the soybean field on the other side of me and they got really scared. They took off and ran into the woods. And I wondered what they had seen. In Missouri, we don't have a lot of apex predators besides like coyotes, feral dogs. In the location that I was in, we do not have any mountain lions, bears, anything like that. But I had seen a figure step out of the woods and walk into the soybean field. It looked like a person wearing a trench coat and they had the same looking hat as the Jeepers Creepers guy. I didn't know what to think at first. I thought it was a person, maybe a homeless person. So I had kind of stepped back into the wood line and I seen the figure 
kind of crouched down and then he jumped up. I would probably say about 10 to 15 feet is what it looked like. And then a pair of bat-like wings came out and he had flapped down really hard. And I could hear the sound of the wings flapping as he ascended. At first, I didn't think that it was real. I was kind of in awe and shock so much that I wasn't even really scared. He jumped up and when he started to fly away, he was flying in the opposite direction of me. So his back was facing basically towards me when he had flew away and he flew over the woods. And that was the last that I had seen. He didn't make any other sounds, but I could definitely hear the sound of his wings flapping as he flew away. To this day, I still don't quite believe what I've seen. I don't know what it is. I I do believe that demons walk this earth. So maybe that was it. Yeah, I just wanted to share that story. I've never really told anybody that in fear that nobody would really believe me. But I wanted to share that story on here. I hope you can use this and thanks again. Jeepers creepers, Devin. This call stuck with me as well. Hell, any story with a monster of any sort always has my heart. And this one certainly struck a chord. So thank you again, Devin, for taking the time to share it. Now, folks, I finally have some news as to the release of our feature film, Shadows in the Desert, High Strangeness in the Brago Triangle. At long last, we've received our official release date, which is March 5th, 2024. Now, we don't know yet where it will be streaming. That info will trickle down to us in a month or so. But for now, the biggest hurdle has been jumped. So mark your calendars for March 5th, 2024. Hopefully streaming on many different online platforms. Now, as for you Kickstarter backers, We'll be in touch very soon to verify your information again. We're confident that we'll get these rewards mailed out sometime before the official release. We're just waiting on those DVD Blu-rays to include in the package. Thank you so much for your patience. Now the rest of you don't need to be patient any longer to hear this next best of entry. And for all those Monster Squad members out there, this one might sound familiar. But to the rest of you, this thing is brand new. So from the Beyond portion of Season 15, Episode 2, please welcome this anonymous caller out of the state of Kentucky. Hi, Derek. I'm calling in from Western Kentucky. Actually, where Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois all kind of converge. I'm, I'm going in uh, without stating my name. It's not my story. This is my wife's story. But uh, to begin with, so uh, my wife for years would drive her mom back and forth to work. And her mom worked you know, odd hours, you know, your typical third shift, 11 to 7 kind of thing same job for all those years same route the whole time but there was one night where she was driving her mom to work and she said what she described to me as uh i think she called them long dogs or tall dogs something like that and i've asked her about it a few times and she said well you know that they were big dogs with abnormally long legs specifically the back legs higher and longer than the front legs. So they were kind of loping along, you know, with this odd gait. She said they were like a reddish brown and there were either two or three of them. So she was, you know, driving, you know, down the road and she was approaching them from behind. So she saw, you know, their backs, their haunches first and didn't really know what they were. And she got a little closer. She could see that either one of them or all of them had their heads turned you know back looking behind them at her approaching and just about the time that 
she recognized what they were, they just sort of dissipated. I don't know if they just, you know, blinked out or, you know, kind of, you know, went away in a dissolving pattern or what, but, you know, they disappeared. So you would think that this would make the situation weirder, but it gave her a moment of relief. She thought, you know, okay, you know, I'm tired. I'm seeing things. I need to get home, you know, get to bed. And uh, right about that time, her mom piped up from the passenger seat and said something to the effect of, did you see those dogs or, you know, what was wrong with those dogs? But either way, she had seen the same thing that my wife did. My mother-in-law tends to be fairly superstitious, and it's always driven my wife crazy. She just didn't respond to her mom because she didn't want to get her, you know, amped up. She didn't feel like getting into it, you know, something like that with her mom, you know, that late at night. But they're not from the area. They're from Milwaukee, but they'd lived here long enough. They'd driven that route long enough. The both of them are familiar with, you know, the wildlife of the area, countless deer, occasional fox, coyote, you know, whatever. This is the only time that either one of them had seen anything like that. And just the fact that they both saw the same thing without either one of them saying anything to each other just lends a bit more credence to the story. My wife and I are both lifelong atheists and as such are just tend to be, you know, prone to skepticism. But I mean, when something like that happens and you can't explain it, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, I'm enjoying the podcast, and uh, thanks for your time. Now, this call fascinated me when it played earlier this year. I just couldn't tell what he was referring to. Long dogs. Was this some sort of new breed? Or a monster? Or something else unexplainable? Delaney did a pretty good job of digging up local tales describing similar strange canines, but no real explanation was ever found. So I figured I'd play it here, cast a bigger net, so to speak. Perhaps someone out there knows exactly what our caller was referring to. Now another paranormal news highlight of the year was back in October when an upright, hairy hominoid was spotted on a Colorado mountain and caught on video. A video of what looks like Bigfoot walking around southern Colorado. Take a look and see what you think. A couple shared this video on social media saying they spotted Bigfoot while riding the Durango and Silverton narrow gauge railroad train. They told Out There Colorado most people on the train didn't notice anything. Over the years, there have been more than 100 reported Bigfoot sightings in Colorado. Now that clip via KUSA, NBC News 9 out of Denver. And from what I understand, this was thought to be some sort of publicity stunt. In fact, a local business that has Bigfoot in the name is thought to be behind the prank. Which I think it very obviously is. Because no secretive forest giant just walks out in front of a train like that. If they did, we would have found these things a long time ago. But what about some of those sightings that can't be explained? Like this one from season 15, episode 10. A Bigfoot encounter from Ray here in California. Hi, my name is Ray. I actually live in San Antonio, Texas, but my story actually took place in Grass Valley, California. When I was really young, I was listening to you know, your podcast for the first time last night, and there was a 911 call about a Bigfoot on Caleva Road and uh, 151, which is pretty much where I've lived my whole life. And it made me really want to tell my story because I've been telling it my whole life to everybody and most find it funny. But, you know, I, I remember back and it, it absolutely terrified me when I was young. My entire family, my dad's side, my mom's side, are from Nevada City, uh, Grass Valley, California, which is kind of Northern California. Um, up in the mountains, used to be a gold mining town, lots and lots and lots of forest out there. And then my grandparents lived really high up on a hill, almost like a, felt like on a mountain. So whenever we'd go to visit them, you know, we would stay, you know, in my mom's old room, 
since my sister and I. And where the bed was, the window was to my right, which kind of faced the backyard, which there was no fence. It just literally looked out into the woods. But we were high up off the ground, so you could kind of see, you know, further down. There was a big wooden deck with stairs that went all the way down to the ground. And so one night I was asleep and I woke up. Um, we had probably been staying there for, at this point, maybe three, four days while we were visiting. And I, I woke up and at the foot of my bed, I would see the light coming from the patio outside of the window, you know, shining onto the wall at the foot of my bed because the light fixture was kind of right outside when you'd go out into the, the upper deck. And so if you were to take a left when you went out the back door and walk maybe, you know, eight or nine feet, the window to the room I was staying in would be kind of right there. So there was a light that just kind of, you know, cascaded in and it always made me feel really comfortable and safe. But this one night I woke up and, you know, was kind of laying there. And I remember looking at the foot of my bed and immediately noticed something different. You know, I was very used to kind of, you know, seeing nothing on the wall, maybe just seeing kind of like the, the shadow of, of the blind, you know, horizontal lines, you know, kind of on the wall. And I immediately noticed something kind of shift into view, I guess you could say, not really view, but the shadow just kind of moved into view. And all I could see was the shadow of a head and shoulders. It seemed really big, really broad. And I mean, I, I remember immediately kind of stop, stopping breathing because I was so scared. I was maybe five years old. I was really young. So this would have been maybe in like 1989, if I had to guess. I was like four or five. So I know I was really young. But I remember being wide awake and seeing it. And I just sat and stared at it. And I remember having the covers kind of pulled up to my chin and being so afraid to even blink or breathe because I felt like if I did, whatever it was would, you know, know that I was watching it or watching its shadow. And the one thing that stands out the most to me was that it was breezy outside. And I could tell that the shadow was something that looked hairy. The head, the, the shoulder, the, you know, the neck as it, you know, the head came down into the shoulders and, you know, stretched out. I could see that it was covered in hair because the wind outside was moving it. And I remember focusing on that more than anything, more than you know, the, the size of it, but, but just seeing the breeze blow the fur on the, the shadow on the wall. And I don't know how long I stared at it. I, I feel like I stared at it for an eternity because I was so afraid. All I wanted to do was get out of bed and run and get my mom, my grandparents. But again, I was just so frozen with fear, I couldn't move. So I just remember kind of slowly, but surely, you know, pulling up the covers more, you know, as much as I could until they covered my face. So I didn't have to look at it anymore. And then I remember waking up in the morning and immediately kind of looking back at the wall. You know, the day the sun was out, the shadow of course was gone, it was daylight. And, you know, I remember getting out of bed and going to the back, you know, walking out of the room, down the hall, through the dining room, and, you know, sliding open the patio door to the back deck. And, you know, even though it was daylight, I was still terrified. And I remember just kind of sliding it and sticking my head out and looking, you know, to the left down the, the walkway of the deck. And uh, there was nothing, you know. And I kind of remember looking around at, like, what? Even at that age, I remember thinking maybe something else cast a shadow, but it was just an empty deck. There was nothing out there except further down to the right, there was a little, you know, fridge, you know, a little, my grandpa kept his beer, <laughs> but it was, you know, like I said, far to the right, there was really nothing that the light, you know, would have, that I could see that would have caught it and looked the way it did, you know, with the, the shoulders and the brawn and the, the fur. Then I, you know, kind of remember just, you know, looking out into the woods and just getting so scared. I just, I went in and I just, I couldn't go out there for as long as I can remember, I was always afraid to go back out there. Anytime we'd go for a walk, I was always very, you know, jittery and, you know, no one believed me. I told you know, my parents, my, my grandparents, and, you know, they all just laughed at me, but, but yeah, they, they had never seen anything. My, my grandpa to this day says he never ever heard anything out there, but I know I wasn't dreaming. I know I was awake. And again, the, the biggest thing that I remember more than anything was just the fur 
the hair, you know, kind of moving in the wind back and forth and just how it, it slid into view or slid into the light and was motionless, you know, just sat there. It didn't move or the fur, you know, kind of caught the wind. But uh, yeah, that was my story. I really appreciate you guys uh, giving a chance to tell it as well. Thank you, Ray. Now, I don't recall exactly what I said about this call when it first aired, but now I can't help but wonder, having listened to it again, if this wasn't simply a raccoon. Now, I have a family of them that crawl all over my house almost every night. I've tried everything to dissuade them. I've even installed spikes to keep them off the roof. But they're clever and persistent. They just find another way. But they do stand up on their hind legs, and if they caught the light just right, the shadow that Ray described could be simply that. A little raccoon peeking in the window. Now, of course, that's just a thought. I certainly can't say for sure that's what it was. But regardless, what a cool and interesting call. So thank you again, Ray, for sharing it with us. Now, folks, the shop has officially reopened. So if Santa didn't deliver the merchandise you were looking for, you can visit MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com and hit the shop tab to grab that gear today. Now, next up is another that was previously behind a paywall. Something out of a Stephen King novel. Please welcome the following caller. Out of New Mexico. So I just called in and left a couple other stories, but I just couldn't help myself about this one because it was just so odd. It's been a long, strange trip in this life. So this one comes from a period of my life. About six or seven years ago, I was living in the New Mexico desert, but traveling a lot back to the Midwest. My father's health was failing, so at least once a month, I would make the long journey to and fro the desert in the Midwest. Then I would stop about halfway in between around Oklahoma City or Tulsa and stay in a cheap hotel because I was kind of broke. And one night was just in deep sleep in the middle of the night and holed up in my little cheapo motel. And it was the type of motel that was set up more so like a hotel where you had the internal structure of the hallways So you had the hallways and then all the rooms that come off it, the multiple levels. Then deep, deep sleep. And I abruptly was woken up by three really loud, really quick knocks. My first thought was, oh, something's happened and it's the cops. You know, something's happened in the building or something's wrong. So I immediately shot up and I went to the door and looked out the hole. And when I looked out the hole, there was a creature, person, potentially, that looked like a jester. I'm just trying to wrap my head around it and figure out a way to verbalize this. My impression that I got was that it was not fully human. It was human size, but it just had a totally different representation. About the height, I'm guessing, of like a average male, maybe a little bit taller, about closer to six feet, wearing all white and purple, like run-of-the-mill, gestery type clothing, face paint, super dirty and disheveled, the hat with the three or four long points on it, and yeah, just really, really dirty, like the white part of the getup was just really disheveled and dirty. So I stepped back from the door for a minute and was terrified. Obviously, heart racing, felt sick, but I had to verify what I saw. So I immediately looked back through the hole and there was no one or nothing there, literally nothing. And with the type of little peephole, you could see pretty far down. I mean, like I was like, I didn't want to open the door because I was terrified, but I was looking down both sides of the hallway through the people. There was nothing there and no way that whatever was there could have ran or it just disappeared. Obviously, I had a really hard time 
came back to sleep, didn't get back to sleep that day, which sucked because I had a really long drive ahead of me the next day. And since then, I've just kind of tried to put it back kind of in, you know, the depths of my memory because it was so strange and I don't have an explanation. And over the years, I think I've tried to come to terms with it just in my own personal knowing and belief that we do live in a dimension among other dimensions that contain other entities and creatures and to just be real with that and diving into it a little bit more I have you know kind of like tried to search on it a little bit and the conclusion I've come to is that maybe what I saw was the type of creature that Native Americans would call like the Hayoka or like through lore you know there's the jester type figure the Pied Piper type character these types of jestery clown type there is the clown archetype because we see things that are obscure and have these obscure sightings. It doesn't mean that we are crazy or that we're imagining things or that we're dreaming. It just is. It just is truth and reality and our brains and our vision are protected in a way from taking in all the stimuli and all the different dimensions that are constantly swirling around us because there's only so much that the human brain and body can handle or has evolved to handle up until this point. But the type of figure that I saw in retrospect, I believe is some kind of a clown archetype, whatever you want to call it. And what has helped really bring home the truth of it for me and solidify my truth is that this archetype has shown up throughout time in various cultures and exists for a reason. So thanks so much for listening to my stories. Have a beautiful day. Now when we make the long drive back to Ohio, the Oklahoma City area is also a stopping point for us. We've stayed in several hotels in that area over the years. Nothing unusual ever happens, but there are plenty of oil workers. It's like a dormitory for those guys. But you know, we did have a weird experience in New Mexico, coincidentally. It was the last time we had driven back, and we were traveling with our cats and our boy Jack, who went absolutely bananas in the room we rented. He meowed and howled and paced around the entire night that we were there. Finally, at around 3 a.m., having gotten no sleep at all, I said to hell with it and we packed up and took off. And wouldn't you know, he was fine the second we left the threshold. I'm just thankful we didn't see a jester-like character. I might have been howling, like old Jackie boy was. Maybe he knew something we didn't. Now moving on, we venture to the next top paranormal news story, of 2023. Back on July 2nd, on a routine flight from Dallas to Orlando, something happened that caused one passenger to lose all control. The woman who was removed from a Dallas flight after an outburst has now gone viral. Take a look. That mother back there is not real. And you can sit on this plane and you can die with them or not. I'm not going to. As you just heard, the woman was pointing to the back on the plane saying someone was not real. American Airlines confirms the plane was heading from DFW to Orlando, but had to return to its gate due to this woman's outburst. Now that clip from KHOU, CBS News 11 out of Houston. And it seems this lady, and I'll leave her name out of it, came clean about the encounter back in November claiming it was all in her head and her outburst had more to do with her than any outside force or entity. So likely too much to drink or a bad reaction to medication. Something along those lines is what I'm gathering. But then again, people are strange. People do weird things. So maybe she did see something like Dave in 
Utah, who had some strange experiences with other people. Do you remember his entry from all the way back on season 14, episode 17? Hey guys, this is Dave from Northern Utah. So I'm calling to report a couple incidences of doppelgangers and a potential contact from them. So last week I was driving, turning right, and as I was turning right, a Jeep was turning left, and so we passed within a few feet of each other, well enough to see the driver. And I looked over, and it just so happened to look like my aunt. I was talking to my mother on the phone at the time, and I told her, hey, it's odd to see her here. I want to call her and see what's going on. So I hung up with my mother and I called my aunt and I was saying, hey, how are you? What are you doing? I just saw you. And I could tell by the background noise in the second that I got done saying that, that I definitely did not see her because she sounded like she was in a public place and not in her car. And sure enough, when the voice came back across the phone, it was my uncle. And he was like, well, actually, no, you didn't just see her. We are in Idaho, nowhere near where you are. And like I said, I'm in Northern Utah. And I was like, oh, well, alrighty then, I guess that settles that. And so I described it to him and I was like, it looked just like your Jeep, it looked just like her. And he just laughed and he said, nope, definitely not her. And so that was that. So fast forward, about a week later, I stopped into my aunt and uncle's house as I was driving past it from work one day. And I was like, hey, that was so strange. Like I was so sure that I saw you and my aunt continued to tell me, oh, I have people call me weekly saying that they think they saw me, but it's not me. She's like, I definitely have a couple doppelgangers and that just become a reality to me is what my aunt said to me. So I chalked it up to just weird and, but it was a little uncomfortable. Like I was never more sure in my life that that was her. Fast forward again, today is April 18th. So last night on April 17th, my wife and I were driving a small back country road, letting our dogs just run along the dirt road, trying to get some energy up before bed. And we saw a car coming, so we pulled the dogs back in the truck for a minute. And as the car passed, I was more than positive that it was one of my friends. It was his Toyota Tacoma. It had the same stickers in all the places that I knew it had, had the same light bar. The guy had my friend's duck hunting hat that he always has on, a big bushy beard and it was heading towards the direction of my friend's house. And so I was never more positive. So I texted him when I got home, I was like, hey, I just saw you on the road. And he was like, no, you didn't. He's like, I've been at work since 3 a.m. Like it, it wasn't me. And I was so strange. So I told him who it looked like. And he was like, you know, he got mad because he wants his truck to be the, the only one that looks like that. So he was all mad that somebody had the nerve to make a Toyota that looks like his and whatnot. And, So I was just like, oh, that is so strange. Two incidents of doppelgangers in one week. Like, how could that be? Well, to make it worse, like I said, today was April 18th. Yesterday was April 17th, and that was the second incident in a one-week period that I swear that I saw somebody that it wasn't them. But, like, I was more than positive. We passed within four feet of each other. And, like like I said, I just have never been more positive in my life. So I get a phone call today from an unknown number that my caller ID wouldn't pick up. And I answer those as a self-employed contractor. I answer them all and I said, hello, this is so-and-so. And And all I got was, stop asking your friends. They are them. No more questions. And they hung up. So I have no idea what that was about. I tried to call it back. As a matter of fact, it's freaked me out so much that I called my friend that works at a police department to try to track the phone call, track the number, if he could get it, and we'll see what I get. But it was just, yeah, really strange. Thanks, guys. Love the podcast. Enjoy. Bye. Derek, Dave from Northern Utah again. I just called in with a doppelganger story, and I figured I would hurry and call back and just give a little bit of detail about some interesting things beyond those two strange occurrences, three strange occurrences, I suppose. So my aunt, when I swear I saw her, it was like two in the afternoon. So broad daylight, sunny sky, clear as could be. When I saw my friend, it was probably 1130 at night. So a little bit darker. But like I said, 
the truck, and this one might have a little bit to say about maybe why there was some confusion beyond the point that I said he's got some very di- interesting dis- uh, stickers in his back window. He's got a, a couple of sticks. Like, he just thought it would be a funny sticker. So it's like a very unique, he had that made sticker and this had it, but this truck had a light bar and the light bar was on. So not only like, so we were half blinded, but when he went past, he was driving slow enough that I was able to adjust and the light bar was so bright, it was able to adjust and make his face brighter. I could see inside the cab much better. So like I said, I saw these people very clearly. And I don't know, I've been caught up with the podcast and the last few episodes seem to have had some doppelgangers in them. So maybe I'm self-projecting doppelgangers into places where they're not simply because I've been listening to the podcast and I've just been thinking about them more. I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, I just thought I'd give you a little bit more information in that way. Once again, love the podcast. Keep it up. Appreciate it. Y'all have a good day. Bye. Thanks, Dave. Now on that original entry, Dave calls back with additional information. So go to Season 14, Episode 17 to catch all that added info. Now you know, folks, doppelgangers have seemed to be all the rage this year. We've seen an increase in these sorts of reports here on the show. And each of those calls seem to generate quite the buzz. There's something about these mysterious lookalikes that really resonates with people. Mostly in a negative way. And if that's you that I'm describing, fear not because I have several other doppelganger stories coming down the pike this coming year. Although I can't say that any of them involve creepy phone calls like Dave's here. That was some good stuff. Now, folks, real quick, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone for tuning in and sharing the show with fellow weirdos. This past year, according to Spotify, we created 2,700 minutes of content. That's 45 hours. And that's not even counting all the beyond bonus material. We were a top 10 podcast for 28,000 listeners, and a top 5 for almost 19,000. And we peaked at number 49 on Apple Podcasts, Society, and Culture Charts. I gotta say, that's pretty good for a little indie podcast like this one. Especially a paranormal-themed podcast. That's all thanks to you people. So take a moment to pat yourself on the back. Shake your own hand. Thanks for keeping us running. But you know, with your help, we can make... 2024 even better. Please share the show on your social media. Tell friends and family to give it a listen. And or buy and wear our merchandise. Anything we can do to spread the word would be a huge help to the show. And it's something greatly appreciated by the entire Monsters Among Us team. Now this next entry aired earlier this season and left all sorts of people well stumped from parts unknown please welcome Ellen the situation I am about to tell you is a hundred percent true my name is Ellen I am now 73 years old it happened my sophomore year in high school 1963 1964 over all this time I have only told two people my sister and my brother. Why? Because I felt no one would ever believe it happened. Growing up, I lived with my family in our house in a town outside of Boston. My sister, who was in the eighth grade at the time, and I always shared the same bedroom upstairs. The furniture in the room was very nice and basic for two girls sharing the space. Two desks with chairs, two bureaus, each with a large mirror on the wall above it, and two beds with a night table between the beds and a new clock radio sitting there. 
every night if we had school the next day, I would turn on the alarm to wake us up at 6 a.m. The radio was always tuned to WBZ 1030 a.m. in Boston. They played the only top 40 rock and roll hits, told the news and weather report, which was really important because if our town canceled school for the day, we would hear the news for sure. The routine was always the same. I would turn the alarm off, but keep the station on so my sister could wake up and hear the radio. I would go then downstairs to wash up first, and next I would come back to the room and take my shoulder-length dark brown hair out of the hair rollers I had slept in and then get dressed for school. I came back to the room in about 20 minutes and started taking the rollers out of my hair as I looked at myself in the mirror, and I could see my sister behind me still in bed. I wasn't sure if she was awake yet. All of a sudden, as I looked in the mirror, I stopped what I was doing and I tilted my head because I was hearing music and it was not WBZ. It was the only music in the room. It was the most beautiful music I had ever heard. Even to this day, it was heavenly music, harps, small tingling bells, violins, and above all, very high pitched sounds, women singing not words, but beautiful long notes together. I was so moved by what I heard. It was unbelievable. The music lasted less than a minute, but definitely more than 30 seconds. I didn't want it to end. I yelled to my sister, can you hear the music? It's beautiful. Just then it stopped. Then my sister says to me, why didn't you leave the radio on? It's off. I thought I had. I had done it endless times, but it was off. So my sister never heard it and didn't believe me. I was wide awake and never ever would have done anything to affect my thinking. I was just getting ready for another day of school. I told no one else for many, many years, only my younger brother. He was sleeping downstairs back then in his room and was only about four and a half years old. He did not disbelieve me when I told him years ago. So what was it? I wish I could hear it again. I can still hum the song they sung. And finally, why was I the only one who heard it? Thank you, Ellen. Now, I enjoy calls that occurred some time ago. Not everything shared here needs to be a contemporary story. Our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents have and had great paranormal stories to tell. So don't be afraid to share them here on the program you haven't figured it out yet. I do my best to feature all walks of life. So a big thanks to you, Ellen, for sharing that tale. Now, as I'd like to do on these year-end specials, I'd like to remind everyone of all the guest appearances I've made over the past year. Just an additional way to soak up some of this creepy content. So in no particular order... Here is that list. Let's Get Haunted. Episode 161. Paranormal Games to Play in the Dark, Volume 5. Bigfoot Collectors Club. Episode 264. Where we covered the Conjuring House. I was on Somewhere in the Skies. Where David and I discussed our upcoming documentary. The I Like to Watch podcast. Episode 35. Where we discussed the Mothman prophecies. And of course, the Band Camp podcast, the Halloween special, where we discuss scary stories to tell in the dark. And this isn't a podcast, so to speak, but I spoke at Anomicon, a virtual conference on the Anomalous, hosted by our friend Ryan Sprague. So be sure to seek out those guest appearances if you'd like to get more of me into your life. Now folks, this next entry was just played a few weeks ago but it seems like people are still talking about it. Believe it or not, I have a bit of an update. So from the state of Utah, please welcome Tina back to the show. Hi, Derek. My name is Tina, and I am from St. George, Utah. This happened in the summer of 2022. 
I went to Walmart, our local Walmart, where, of course, weird people are all the time. But as I was walking through and I was kind of focused, very focused on getting what I needed to get and get out of there. And as I was walking, I saw this man and he was speaking to another man. And he was very short, maybe chest high on me. And in my head, I thought the word troll. And then I started to kind of admonish myself, like, why would you say that? that's so unkind? And I, it's just not like me to, to be so unkind. And when I heard the word troll in my head, he literally, I didn't say it out loud, but he literally turned around to look at me and I dropped my eyes and I just kind of walked past and I went to uh, across the store and to another aisle and just thought what is wrong with you and, and I went to another aisle light bulb aisle got light bulbs and I came out of the light bulb aisle to go to another part of the store and I had a cart and as I was pushing the cart I realized that I almost hit somebody coming out of that aisle and it was that same man and when I almost hit him I kind of like stopped and like like to apologize like oh my gosh you know I almost hit you and I watched his eyes and they blinked sideways not up and down but sideways and the pupil wasn't round it was almost like a snake and this startled me and I went like that and he smiled and he had these jagged teeth like to a point and that scared me horribly and I just took off running through Walmart and I could hear him he was running behind me and he was making this really strange high-pitched like ee, ee, running behind me and people were staring at me because I'm running like a wild person through Walmart, but they weren't staring at him running behind me, making this weird noise. They were staring at me like I was crazy. And I get to the main aisle and I just instantly go to the checkout and I'm texting my best friend and saying, can I call you? Something really weird just happened at Walmart. You're not gonna believe this. And I get through the checkout and I call her and I said, can you just stay on the phone with me? You're not gonna believe me, but I just saw a troll. I swear it was a troll at Walmart. And she said, did he have on jean shorts, boots, and a green t-shirt? And I was so taken aback because that was exactly what he had on. And I said, how did you know that? And she said, I was just there at Walmart 30 minutes ago and he was waiting by my car. He read a sticker off of his car and she literally did the voice and she goes yeah he was reading my sticker and he goes free will healing to her and she said I just got the creeps got in my car and took off that made me even more creeped out but that's my story hope you have a great day and wonderful show thank you for all you do thank you Tina Man, that call got a lot of attention. People either loved it or were completely creeped out by it. And a few people even wrote in saying that that's something one should expect on a visit to Walmart. And even more of you let me know that this story had already been covered on our friend Shannon LeGros' podcast, Into the Fray. Now, I've linked to that episode in the show notes, or you can search out Into the Fray, episode 392. The troll stuff comes in during the latter half of the episode, if you want to cut straight to the action. Shannon and her show are pretty great. So if that story had you even slightly interested, I think you should give it a listen. And speaking of our friend Shannon... She lives in the Las Vegas area, the location of her next major paranormal news story of 2023. And this is a big one. Back in June, news outlets were taken by storm when residents of a Las Vegas home called 911 claiming to have seen aliens in their backyard. Here's WPVI ABC News 6's coverage on the series of events.
Police in Las Vegas found themselves in the middle of a UFO mystery last month after an out of this world 911 call. They're like nine foot, ten foot tall. They look like aliens to us. Big eyes, they have big eyes. A family called police on May 1st saying something had crashed in their backyard. They also said they saw large, non-human creatures roaming around the crash site. As far-fetched as it might sound, officers took the case and the call very seriously after a mysterious sighting of their own. It's like a big creature. A big creature? Yeah, like around 10 feet tall. Because I'm not going to BS you guys. One of my partners said they saw something fall out of the sky too, so that's yeah. why I'm kind of curious. Did you see anything land in your backyard? Or? Well, after nothing unusual was found during a brief search of the yard, officers closed the case, labeling it unfounded. This story is pretty wild, and it seems that the Vegas police are taking it seriously. I even saw a report claiming that the police department put surveillance equipment all over the home, and that strange vehicles have been camped out out front. Well, it's all been pretty quiet for a while, but for a few minutes there, I too thought maybe we'd get a real-life alien out of this one. And who's to say that we won't still? Because believe it or not, this wasn't the biggest news story of the year. There is one bigger that paves the way for all sorts of strange activity. But we'll touch more on that here in a bit. First, I have a couple more calls I'd like to share with you tonight. Like this one, from Zach, up in Minnesota. Hi Derek, this is Zach calling from St. Paul, Minnesota. I just recently uh, discovered your show and heard an episode, I think his name was Edel, in season 13 uh, about uh, Glimmer Man. I had an experience back in 2008. Uh, I was playing in a band and came home late at night. It was probably about 2.30 in the morning or 3 and was sitting in my car and thinking about how interesting it is that there are so many things in the world are, that our perceptions are only limited to what our brains can comprehend and thinking about how interesting it would be to be able to see everything that was going on. And I was just sitting there thinking about that when in a house down the block, I started to see a light moving around and I was just watching it and interested in that and uh, noticed across the street from that house was a human figure that was uh, what I've learned is a glimmer man. It was uh, shimmery and translucent standing there and I got the feeling like it was watching the light that was traveling around in the house across the street. And I watched it for a while and the light in the house came out into the front porch area of the house, moved around a little bit, and then came through the window and zipped up into the sky. And uh, I turned my attention back towards the glimmer man that was standing there. And I got the feeling that it got the feeling that it was being watched and it started to scan around. And then I got the feeling that I was being watched and I got a little freaked out. And this figure started walking down the block in my direction. Uh, a car came by and kind of blinded everything out with uh, its headlights. And so I kind of lost track of where this figure was. When that car had passed, I was kind of looking around and I noticed it was on my side of the street now uh, where I was parked and continuing to walk towards me. I started to get really kind of freaked out and decided that when the next car came, I would get out of my car while the car could see me and go into my house. So I did that <laughs> and went into my house and I had a cat at the time. And I was sitting there, kind of decompressing from what had just happened, feeling really freaked out. There's a lot of other thoughts I was having at the time. I was feeling like maybe I was witnessing something strange. But anyway, I was sitting in my house and 
decided to get a bowl of cereal to just have a snack while I was kind of like decompressing from whatever this whole situation was and sitting there with my cat watching me and I started to feel, I don't know how to describe it, like electricity, kind of like a vibration. And it was pretty vibey. And at the same time, I was trying to kind of ignore it. And at the same time, I was feeling like air moving around my face, like something was blowing on me or something uh, really lightly really lightly but it was moving and the weird thing was was the the vibration was feeling like it was coming from the same place as this air was coming from so I looked at my cat and she is looking at the same place and tracking it with her eyes as it's moving around where I'm feeling the vibration and this air moving across my face and I'm trying to stay calm and at the time my wife and I were living in this apartment upstairs and our one-year-old daughter was in the bedroom across the hall and we had a dog as well and my cat's watching this thing and she's not freaking out or anything she's just watching it and it, I wouldn't say that I felt menaced or anything like I felt fear when I saw the glimmer man this felt like something completely different uh, and it had come through my window I felt it come in Anyway, so it's moving around, and I can feel it go down my hall and over towards our bedrooms. And as it goes down there, and my cat's watching it the whole time go down the hall, it goes over by my dog, and my dog stirs in his sleep. And then it comes back over by me. I'm just watching my cat's eyes and kind of, I can feel where it was, and I'm getting this vibration feeling. That's the only way I'm able to tell where this thing is. It comes back over by me and I could feel it again. And then it goes back down the hall and goes into my daughter's room, presumably, because she starts stirring in her sleep and making sounds. And it comes back out, vibes around me again and blows around my face. And then I could feel it go out the window and gone. And it was gone for a little while. And it came back in and was doing it again, kind of blowing around my face. And I'm watching my cat's eyes and it's going around the room and it comes right up in front of my face, right in front of my nose and I can feel it blowing on my face. And I'm looking at my cat's eyes and my cat is looking at the space right in front of my face and I'm feeling these vibes. And then my cat looks right into my eyes and maybe it's just a coincidence or whatever, but like my whole body went like electric, <laughs> like huge vibrations. And then it came out of my body again, and it zoomed away. And that started a whole bunch of nights there, and then in subsequent homes where I have been visited by this being. I never saw the Glimmer Man again with my eyes, but I don't know that they aren't around. And it seemed to me that this Glimmer Man was interested in this phenomena that was in this other person's house and presumably interested in, I don't know, I don't know what, but like, it was weird. And uh, had no idea what Glimmer Men were until I started listening to your podcast just recently. And Edel's story with the little floating fish thing kind of reminded me of uh, what happened to me. And I thought I'd share this story with you. Thanks, and uh, love your podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Now, Glimmer Man is another character that really seems to be rising in popularity as of late. And it certainly helps when you put a name to the entity, which our friends down at Expanded Perspectives podcast seem to have done a number of years ago. It's believed that they actually coined the phrase Glimmer Man. You see, once one of these entities has a name, it's easier for people to talk about it. It's easier for people to relate. There's a reason that a vast majority of these topics we discuss have clever names. Because those are the ones that stick. Now, do you remember when I said there was a bigger news story that paved the way for other strange claims? 
like claims that someone here on Earth has developed and implemented a near-invisible camouflage system. Well, back in July, a whistleblower by the name of David Grush testified that our government not only knows about UFOs, or UAPs as they call them, but they've recovered several crashed craft, complete with non-human biologics. This is a big deal, folks. UFOs exist. The U.S. government found quite a number of them, and they are indeed of non-human origin. Those are the explosive allegations from a former intelligence officer tonight in a whistleblower complaint that the inspector general is taking very seriously. 36-year-old Air Force veteran David Grush is exposing what he calls a top-secret military program that has reportedly found wreckage of fully intact UFOs. For years, there have been whispers and rumors that the government had aircraft of non-human origin. This report is the first evidence it might be true. Now that clip property of News Nation's Elizabeth Vargas reports. And like I said, this is a very, very big deal. This guy Grush, he's not a nobody. He's a decorated combat veteran and a former intelligence officer as well as a member of several government task forces designed to investigate UFOs and UAPs. Simply put, he would know. And he has a lot to lose by speaking up. So if even half of what he's telling us is true, something or someone is visiting us here on Earth. And our government not only knows about it, but has the evidence in hand. Could that be where things like Glimmer Man are coming from? Something reverse engineered from one of those recovered vehicles. And as if all that wasn't spooky enough, Grush also claims that people have been hurt and even killed by not only our government trying to keep these secrets hidden, but by the entities themselves. Well, this is certainly something we're going to keep our eye on in the new year because it helps support claims like this one sent in from the Upper Peninsula all the way back on Season 15, Episode 5. So I was going to give you my name, but people up here think I'm weird enough as it is. So I'm currently located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, and there's a lot that leads up to this, but to keep it short, I'll just get to the point. A year ago, I was staying at my mom's house, and I typically stay up pretty late, kind of have a hard time falling asleep. So I'm in bed, I'm on my iPad trying to pick something on YouTube to fall asleep to. I look at the clock on there and it says 3.04 or something like that. Uh, I lay back, close my eyes, slowly start to drift off, and wake up to my itchy beard. So I'm scratching my face and I just happen to look to my left. And there's a tall, gray-skinned, pale-eyed, like emaciated thing standing there. The best way I can really describe it is to compare it to like Smeagol from Lord of the Rings and Voldemort, if they had a baby. That's kind of what it looked like. And it was just staring at me like it was shocked or surprised that I'd woken up and seen it. Like it didn't expect to be caught. And I started kicking and scooting and yelling. And as I'm doing that, it creeps to the corner of the room where my view of it's obscured by um, a stack of pillows next to me. And the next part's kind of hard to explain. I don't really know how to put it, but I guess I lost consciousness. Somehow I ended up back asleep, and when I woke up, I looked at my clock, and 40 minutes had gone by. I made the mistake of telling my girlfriend and my mom, and of course, you know, they're supportive and say they believe me, but I know they don't. Anyway, that's it. Hopefully, uh, you can use this. If not, no worries. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, caller. Now, there should be no question as to why this one was included. A gray alien in the bedroom. It honestly doesn't get much creepier than that. But you know, it's important to note that 
None of the verbiage used by Grosh indicates that these are indeed aliens. In fact, they seem very careful not to imply that. Which makes me wonder if they may be interdimensional in some way. But truth be told, for most of my life I've entertained the idea that what we perceive as aliens is actually a version of us from the distant future. Some sort of evolved version of a homo sapien. I guess in this case we'll just have to wait and see. Well, folks, I hope you had a good time rummaging through the greatest calls of this the year of our Dark Lord 2023, because we're nearing the end. But I do have one more entry for you. Probably my favorite of the year. From the territory of Puerto Rico, please help me usher Jesus back to the airwaves. Hey Derek, it's Hey Zeus here from the island of Puerto Rico. I gotta say that I love this space that you have created for people to call in or email their sightings and stories. I think it's it's really awesome. 14, 15 years ago, I grew up in the central part of Puerto Rico in the in the mountains. I grew up in a coffee farm, and this was a weekend. I remember I was in high school. We were wrapping up coffee season, and we were starting to prepare for the next one. And I remember waking up this Saturday morning, early morning, with my dad, and we were getting our stuff ready and getting the truck sorted out with all our stuff. And I see my neighbor walking into our property, walking down the road and heading towards us. And he was not okay. He did not look good. He looked pale. And he came to us and asked us if we heard anything during the night because he got to his home and noticed that all of his turkeys have been killed. He had a hen of over 50, 60 turkeys, decent size, 15, 20 pounds already, mature animals that he would raise and sell in a little farmer's market in town. And he was just wondering if we've heard anything, if, the, if our dogs barked, if his dogs barked, if we have heard anything at all, we, were, we did not hear nothing at all. He was extremely distressed. I, I don't think I've ever seen him like, like that. But my dad and I started to talk with him, try to calm him down, and he was really distressed. So my dad was like, hey, how about you go over there and help him out and see what he needs to figure out, see if he needs help fixing his pen, see if you can see something, and just go out and help him out. So I headed over there with my neighbor, and when I got there, it was like, I'm seeing, I mean, you would see dead carcasses all over the pen. Something really gnarly, something I've never seen before. But something I noticed right away is that all the turkeys that were in the pen dead had no head. They were beheaded. There were no head to the body attached. The heads were not anywhere to be around. There were five or six that were moribund when we got there. They were about to die, but the rest of them were dead and had no head attached to the body. We spent close to two hours looking closely at the pen. It had a fence that was six, seven feet tall, a locked gate, really no access for any stray dogs, any other animals. We have no big felines. We have nothing like that. We don't have coyotes down there in Puerto Rico. We don't have anything like that. We don't even have big game down there. So the, when it comes to animals that could have gotten in there and do that damage, that is extremely, extremely rare. The first thing that comes to mind is the stray dog. There was no way that the stray dog can jump six, seven feet over a fence to get to those animals. And it was something extremely, extremely gnarly. We went over, started to look, started to gather carcasses, and we did not find a single track inside. It was something really odd. So after we gathered all those carcasses up, we piled them up and we buried them. We put an extra fence around it because we did not know what was the problem with that. The gate was locked. We just did not know. It was, it's something that to this day we still don't know what it was. And uh, I headed back home that evening. My dad and I always like to take walks around the farm after we have dinner. And uh, we have dinner and 
we had it over to the farm to do this walk and we noticed that in a section we found a bunch of feathers about 150 200 feet away from that pen and uh, we started to look underground to see if we saw anything that could lead us to what did this to my neighbor's turkeys and uh, we ended up in a corner of the farm which is not my favorite because a lot of stuff has happened in there we ended up in that corner and we found more feathers that led us to a big tree there's a species of tree in Puerto Rico called mocha it's a big big tree it's solid trunk it's used widely for wood for different purposes and it's now a protected species because it was almost extinct because it was such a good source of wood and lumber in the 50s and 40s and when we go over to that corner we notice something that to this day i i have no explanation i've dealt with animals of all sorts i've had plenty of experience because of my line of work with dealing with exotic animals livestock domestic animals pets you name it and we are the trunk about five six feet from the ground and that trunk of that tree to this day i it, it was a nest, and it was a nest, but it was a massive nest that had a bunch of fur. It was like fur and hair, and it had a bunch of bones, of different size bones within the sticks and the wood. Whatever made that nest, it was probably very, a very strong beam. I don't know if you call it an animal. I really do not know what it was. It was a very strong beam that made that nest. And I remember we bumped into it. I was like 14, 15. I've never been a, a small kid. I've always been a little chunky. And my dad was like, get on top of it. Like, climb it and see what it, let's see what you see. And I was, you know, just a teenager. Like, All right. And I remember getting on top of that nest and it was big enough that I could lay on it comfortably. So whatever made that thing was massive, massive, massive. And it had a clear path of flying in and out because all the branches on top of it were ripped out of that tree. So whatever came in and out of that tree, that nest had a clear landing path and clear flying off path. I remember seeing bones, smaller bones that looked like could be rodent bones. I saw bones that looked like could be dog bones that were big enough to be uh, dog bones. It was something really gnarly. I really, you know, and I remember I got off of that nest and walking back with my dad. My dad was like, I have no clue what that is. That is just something extremely, to this day, something that we question what could have been. Uh, next morning, was a Sunday morning. My parents are uh, very religious people, and uh, I remember I woke up at like 8, 9.30, and my dad was coming back from the farm, and I was like, hey, Dad, like, what, what were you doing? Like, what's up? He's like, oh, it's nothing. It's, it's nothing. I was just doing some stuff in the farm before going to church. I remember we went to church. So after I came back from church, I kind of snuck out of the house and went over to that corner. A little bit worried, concerned about everything that had happened. And I noticed that my dad had cut down the tree and had burned the tree in the nest. It, it was cold when I got there. Still hot, but it was cold. And I didn't think that my dad did that. At first, I saw that thing burning and I was like, whoa, what happened here? So I came back to the house. Oh my like, dad, the tree got caught fire in the nest. Like, what, what happened here? And he was not too verbal about it. He was like, yeah, I just went there and cut it down. I'm like, Dad, like, why would you do that? Like, we were going to take pictures? Like, we were going to call the Department of Natural Resources, the Rangers, wildlife officers, and see if they know anything? Like, well, what is it? Like, we, we really, I really wanted to know what it was. And my dad was extremely nonverbal. He was like, no, don't worry about that. It's just, it's fine. I cut it down and said, it's all right. I don't know. It's fine. He was just not verbal at all about it. He did not want to talk about it to this day. He does not talk about it. But the chilling thing is that that night, it was a Sunday night. That night, around 12, 1 a.m., I started to hear on the farm cries, like big 
surprised. Like, I don't know if anybody listening has heard that a Java Peacock call, like that that high pitch yell that they emit, something like that. I have no clue what it was to this day. It's still kind of like, I wonder what it is, what that thing was. I assume that whatever was in that nest was that thing that took out my neighbor's turkeys because anything that came into that pen had to come over the fence or flew fall into the pen from the outside. There's nothing jumping it. There was no damage to the fence. So I connect those two things because it's just so coincidental. And I w I've never seen, I've researched nests of big birds throughout the world. I've tried to look information on birds and, and see, see, I've talked to ornithologists about what could have been. I just don't know what can build a nest as big as, as that thing. Because I've seen we have a species in Puerto Rico, a, a red-tailed hawk, that makes pretty big nests. But definitely not a nest that 14, 15 year old like me could have laid on like I did with that one. So just throwing this out there, maybe somebody has heard something like that or has seen something like that in the Caribbean or, or any other part of the world. I would love to hear it. Yeah, that's my story. Thank you, Derek. And uh, talk to you all soon. Thank you, Jesus. You see, once you start to believe Mr. Grosh and the claims that he made earlier this year, Stuff like this, what we can only assume is the infamous Puerto Rican chupacabra. Stop existing in places of lore and legend, and instead drift into the maybe category. Or at the very least, it should be added to the long list of claims that we should maybe take another look at. Because if his claims are anywhere near the truth, I suppose now anything is possible. And folks, that's going to do it for this year-end special. I know I said it already, but I really do mean it. Thank you all for an incredibly successful year here at Monsters Among Us Studios. And trust me when I say we are hard at work, turning that success into a bigger and better product. So be sure to follow along in 2024 to see that terror evolve. Now I leave you with this final request. Please. Have yourself a happy and safe new year. Now, Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Copyright Red Crow Media. Additional support is provided by Sarah Carter Hayes and Delaney Bowers. All media used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. Be sure to follow us on social media on YouTube and leave us a rate and review if you could. Don't forget you can listen to the show on internet radio at the UnX Network Saturdays at 11 p.m. Eastern. Just visit unx.com to tune in. Finally, tonight's score was provided by Envato Elements Co.he Music Alexander Nakarada and Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Be sure to stick around after the outro for that full Weird Man song. And above all else, keep it spooky. And have a good night.
Now I sneak a secret entry into nearly every episode that I produce. A tradition we started back in season 11 or something like that. I honestly don't remember. But it has been quite a while. Anyway, it's here that I share the strangest calls. The ones that don't really fit anywhere else. Calls like Mike's. Out of New England. Hey Derek, this is Mike. I'm from, I'd say, the tri-state area, New England. Maybe you wouldn't think it, but it's actually pretty rural. Most areas around here. Just listening to your show, and it reminded me of this uh, trippy story that I've been hearing from one of the kids that grew up a couple, couple streets down from me. Just want to preface this by saying the type of kid that experienced this and told this story, he was not to be condescending, but he had not really much of a personality. He was, uh, you know, just a real average kind of guy not the type of person you would expect to recount some type of wild story or you know anything like that he didn't believe in aliens ufos nothing like that he was a real run-of-the-mill you know kind of kid and uh that's why this has stuck with me so much i'd say probably about junior year of high school was the first time that i heard it this occurred to him when he was maybe about nine years old, nine or 10 years old. And uh, his family had a house and out in the back of the house was uh, kind of like, uh, I don't know what you would call it. It was like a wine cellar. They had a couple freezers down there, or ice boxes or whatever for storing meat, you know, deer and stuff that they had killed or whatever. And uh, this was out in the back of the house like a stairwell that led down to this kind of a little basement area and I've I've seen the house myself before so anyways when he was uh, like I said about that age 9 or 10 he's out in the backyard playing around and for whatever reason he wanders down to this cellar and uh, he gets down to the bottom of the stairs and looks over to where there's these two long ice boxes sitting on, on, you know, over on one side of the uh, cellar. From what he describes, it was like uh, almost like a guy that looked like a cross between Quasimodo and Chunk from the Goonies, just like a real messed up looking big dude, you know, contorted face and, and the whole nine yards. And this guy is, he's got the ice box open and he's, he's just stuffing raw meat in his mouth. He's, he's just getting into that raw meat that they had down there in the ice boxes. Needless to say, he turned tail and he ran to the top of the stairs of the cellar. And he says he remembers trying to open the door to get out. And it felt like it was locked and turning around and seeing this guy kind of looking at him and slowly walking towards him. He's hammering on the doorknob. He's freaking out. And uh, then it just finally pops open. He runs out into the yard, screaming and crying, goes and tells his parents. His father comes out, has a look around, and the father wasn't able to find anybody, but they were able to see that somebody had been in that icebox eating on that raw meat. So I always just thought it was a wild story. Totally forgot about it. Just listening to your podcast is what brought it back to mind. Like I said, just the type of kid that that told this story. In my personal opinion, there's no way in a in a million years that he was just fabricating this or or telling it for the for the hell of it. I I've always got freaked out every time I've heard about it. Every you know, a lot of kids around here that were my age at the time, we all knew about the story and uh, just felt like it was worth mentioning. Peace and love. Now, honestly, who doesn't want to devour raw meat by the handful, returning us to a more simple life? And you know that might be the game plan for 2024. If the trend continues, it might not give us a choice. 
It's an awesome entry, Mike, and one of my favorites on the year. So thank you again for calling it in. And a big thank you one last time for an awesome year of podcasting. I'll catch you all back here next week with a brand new installment. And for all the Patreon supporters, there'll be no Beyond After Show today. That portion will resume next week. Until then, Happy New Year, everyone. And again, have a good night.